Hello everyone, this is the video tutorial for lab 4. So in this lab we will learn how to implement an FSM using Verilog. So the tasks needs to be done in this lab are as follows. So first we need to design and implement an overlapping sequence detector using Mili FSM and verify its functionality using test bench. The second is to design a clock pulse generator while taking care of push button debounce. And finally we need to test the functionality of our design on the hardware. So we will be designing a sequence detector capable of detecting this sequence 1100. So overlap is allowed for the sequence detector. So what what does that mean? So for overlap type, overlapping type sequence detector, what we can do, we can use the ending bits of the sequence as the start bit of the next sequence. So to understand it better, let's take an example. Yeah. So let's say this is my input bit stream. So this is coming one one zero one one zero zero. Let's say zero one one. Okay. So what happens is once the pattern is detected, so my first pattern is one one zero one one. So till that time I don't get my complete pattern. My output bits will remain zero. And once I get the pattern, I will be getting a one at the output, right? Now what happens when an overlapping sequence uh, when the sequence detector is the overlapping one? So I can use the last ones as the start of the next sequence. So I can use these two ones as the start of the next sequence. So I have got two ones. Now I got a zero. Now I got again two ones. So that means my sequence is completed here again, right? So now let's see what happens when the sequence detector is non overlapping, type, right? So again, take the same example, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, right? And I will extend this as well. So zero, zero, and finally one. So this should this should be the output for the overlapping type sequence detector. Now let's see what happens in the case of non-overlapping type sequence detector. Right? So the first sequence detection will remain the same. Uh, but when it comes to the next sequence detector, I cannot use these two bits as the starting for the next sequence. I will have to start again from the square one. So now let's see. I will again get a zero here. That's fine. Now from here, the sequence detection will get started. I got, I got a one. Again, I got a one. Again, I got a zero, one. And finally, I got a sequence, right? So as I can see, if the sequence detector is an overlapping type, for the same sequence, I got three highs in the output, right? Three times the output goes high. But my when the sequence detector is non-overlapping type, the output goes high only for the two times. So that's the difference between an overlapping type and the non-overlapping type, uh, type sequence detector. Now let's see what is this Mille and Bure FSM. You must have read them. Uh, in your digital circuit course, but I will give you a brief overview again. So in the Mealy machine, the present output depends on the present state as well as the input, right? The present input. But in case of the Mealy machine, the output depend only on the present state, not on the input. So that's the major difference, the difference between both. But one common thing that you can see in both of these diagrams is there are three blocks. One is your next state combinational logic, one is your state register, and one is the output combinational logic. So we will follow the same rule. We will define three always block in our Verilog code. So one block will be doing the, this uh, work as a state register, one block will be working as this next state combinational logic, and one block will be doing the job of this output combinational logic, right? Now let's look into the design details. So we will be using two push buttons to enter the input sequence. So two, one, one button will be assigned as input zero and one is assigned as input one. So whenever I want to give an input zero, I will press that corresponding button. And similarly, if I want to give an input one, I will press that corresponding push button, right? The third thing is use the debouncing circuit to generate a clean pulse if any of the push button is pressed. So what is this debouncing circuit? We will look into it in the subsequent text, right? 
Now let's go to the, the fourth thing is we need to generate a pulse whenever one of the button is pushed. And with this pulse, this pulse will be used to uh, use for sampling for, uh, in the FSM. So the FSM clock should be derived from this circuitry. So, so the whole idea is whenever a, one of the button is pressed, either it is input 0 or input 1, a clock pulse should be generated. And once that clock pulse is generated, the FSM should sample the uh, particular input. Right. So when I talk about the FSM sampling the input, input 1 will be the input of the FSM. Right. So whenever the desired sequence is detected, the output pin should go high like this. This, uh, this will be the our reference example which we'll be taking. Uh, there should be a reset functionality. So whenever this reset button is pressed, my circuit should come into a known state. And we have to display the current state and the output on the VIO, right? Okay, so now let's look into the push button debuffs. But before that, let's look into the buttons and switches. What are the difference between them? So we have been using from past two labs the, this board. This is the board which is connected to a remote server. This is the Zygo board. So over here you can see this this square block. This The one part of it contains the FPGA as well. So for timing, you can think of it, this is your FPG. This is square part is your FPG, right? And as you can see, these four thing, this, these are the switches, right? And these are the push buttons. So as buttons from button zero to button three. So we are using these, if, if, if would have been present physically, this board would have been present but physically, we will, we will be using these buttons to give the inputs for the reset for input 0 and input 1 but right now we are giving it through the VIO but but for the for the practical purpose we need to use the debouncing circuitry whenever we use these push buttons so what is the debounce effect like whenever you push this button we expect that the output should go high but this is not the case whenever you push this button so this bounce a bit so it, it will it won't directly go to logic one. So what will actually happen is it will make certain body bounces, right? So as you can see at this instant, I press this button. So it made some D bounces and finally it goes high, right? So I don't need these bounces, right? Whatever D bounces happen here in this meantime, I don't want it. I only want a clean one logic height. So for that thing, I need to design some circuitry to tackle this problem. Right. So the very first thing is when when you press a switch, so it 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 it, it, it takes some seconds, uh, a, a couple of seconds maybe. So when I talk about seconds, so the D bounces should happen in the order of milliseconds, right? So the whole idea of this circuitry is to sample the three samples, right? We need to take three samples of this input, but input uh, input coming from the button. And from those three samples, I need to generate the complete pulse, the actual pulse, the debounced uh, version of this pulse, right? So what happens is I will give a pulse whose time period is in millisecond. That the clock, uh, that the clock which I will be giving to this circuitry, its time period should be in milliseconds. So the reason behind giving the input in millisecond is that whenever you push this button, so this debounces will be happening in the order of milliseconds. Right. So in order to capture that, I will be giving a clock of milliseconds. So what I will do is, I will get the three samples at the three clock edges. Right. So that's why I'm using the shift register. Once I get the three samples, I will do a logical end. And once I do the logical end, I will get a final value, whether it is logic one or it is logic zero. Right. One more thing that needs to be noted here that for the last flip flop, I am taking the inverted output, not the true output. So the reason being, if I take the direct output, although I can get uh, my output pulse to be uh, to get high, but I won't be uh, able to do uh, get get this pulse low, right? So that only reason I'm using the final output as the inverted output. So that's all about the debouncing effect. So we will look into the circuitry as well as the test bench of it, so we will understand it better from the uh, circuitry as well as I mean the very low code as well as the test bench. So the whole idea, the whole block level design of our sequence detector is this. 
So I will take an input of 125. This is not the 100 megahertz clock. This is the 125 megahertz clock. And from that 125 megahertz clock, I will make a clock of 200 hertz. This 200 hertz clock will go through this clock pulse generator. So what this clock pulse generator contains? So this clock pulse generator contains once debouncing circuitry plus some logic to to generate a clock pulse whenever one of the input uh, button is pressed, either input zero or input one, right? So that's why we have done a logical OR of both of these things, input zero and input one. So once this is done, I will pass that clock pulse. So whenever one of this input is high, I will generate a clock pulse and that clock pulse will be sent to the FSM. And then FSM will sample the input one, whatever the state it is, and it will work accordingly. Whether I'm getting a, uh, correct sequence or not, this will take the decision, right? So this is a very abstract view of our design. So we will look into the design and see how does it works. So before starting the actual implementation of the design, I would like to get you through this di state diagram. So what is happening? Initially, we will be in the reset state. So this is the reset state as zero. So if we are in the reset state and the zero comes, we will stay in this state only. If one comes, that means the first bit of the sequence is detected. I will move on to the next state, that is S1, right? Now, while I'm in S1, if zero is the input, I will back, go back to the S0 because the sequence is 11011. I don't need any zero. I need another one to get, get through the sequence, right? And also, output will remain zero until unless my sequence gets detected, right? While I'm in S1, if I get a one, I will jump to the next state, that is S2. Right, and while in S2, if I get a one, if I get a one, that means I have already got a one, another one I have already got. Now, if I get a one, instead of going through this, uh, uh, going to the S0 state, I will stay put at this S2 state because I've already got a one and now I have got a one. That means I have got two ones of the sequence. So, there's no need to go back to S0 right now, right? So, next, if the zero is detected. I will go to the next state that is S3. So till now what we have detected 110. So 110 has been detected. So we are in S3 and finally if I get one more one, I will get to S4. If I get a zero, I will go back to the S0 that is the starting state. And while I'm in S1, that means 1101 had been detected. And if I get a one, I should get a output high. But instead of going back to S0, I will go back to S2, right? Because I already had a one and I get a one as well. So that means I can start my sequence right from here, right? I got a one one. That's what we talked about in this example. So once I got a one one, I can use this one one as the starting of the next sequence, right? So that's why I went back to the S2 state, right? If it is zero, definitely my sequence is broken. I need to go to the reset state. So that was all about the state diagram of this particular circuit. So yeah, so this is a typo mistake. So this is the thing, 1101, right? All right. So le now let's start with the designing on the one. Okay, so now let's create a new project. First, we'll create the top module of the sequence detector. So there are four input ports. One is my 125 megahertz clock. Another is the clear port that is for reset purpose. Next is for input zero. Another is for input one. 
and we have two output ports one is your out that will get high only when the sequence is detected and the last port is my present state it's again an Right. So what we need to do is we need to make from the 100 megahertz clock. I need clock. So for that, first we associate a clocking IP. From the clocking IP, we'll make a 5 megahertz clock. And from the 5 megahertz clock using the clock divider, I will generate a clock under uh, 200 inch clock. Right. So first, now let's instantiate the clocking IP. So before that, add the clocking IP to your design. Okay. Okay. Visit. So I'm changing this name as clock IP. So always remember this, I have to give the input as the system clock, not the custom clock. So why, when I give the input as the system clock, so my tool will know what will be the uh, input frequency of that particular board as I have defined the board in the earlier steps. So always select it as the system clock. Next thing is we can check that my input clock is of 125 megahertz or not. So that's fine. In the output clock, I only need one clock. That is of 5 megahertz. Okay, that's fine. And I have to untick this reset and lock. Rest of the things looks good. And I can click on OK. So while this clocking IP is getting synthesized, I can instantiate it using the instantiation template. So just copy the instantiation template from clock.video. So the input to this clock So the input to this clock is the 125 megahertz clock The into this clocking IP and The output is the 5 megahertz clock Right So the next thing is to provide this 5 megahertz clock as an input to the clock divider which we made in lab 2 and get an output of 200 hertz right so we don't need to write this module again what we can do is we can directly add it from the desired directory so add or create design so instead of creating the file i can add the file so this is my directory of lab 3 right so from the lab 3 sources directory, I can directly take this clock divider module. Right, so these two options will be unticked in your case. So what you can do is you can take them. In that case, this file will be copied to the current project as well. Right, click on finish. So 
So plot divider is in your project right now. So one thing which I forgot to mention in lab two video, sorry, lab three video, was that what is the use of this parameter here? So in lab three, we generated one hertz clock from the five megahertz clock. So we calculated that the division value should come out like this, this two, four, nine, nine, triple nine. So what happens is that when we, when we associated this clocking IP, we never gave, uh, gave any value to this D1 underscore value, but still my design was working fine. So the reason be whatever value we gave it here, this is the default value. So in case during association, we, you do not pass uh, this value from the module in which you are associating this module. So this will take as a default value. So my input clock frequency was 5 megahertz and the default value was this. So while uh, so by using default value, I was able to generate the 1 hertz clock. But right now I need to generate a clock of 200 hertz. For that, this value is not, uh, division value will change. So my division value will come out to be 12,499 if I apply this formula. So the given frequency is again 5 megahertz and the required frequency is 200 hertz. That is 2 into 200, that is 5 megahertz by 400. So that comes out to be 12,499. So the value of this parameter. So instead of changing it here, what I will do is during association of the module, I will pass this value. So now let's see. We'll use hash p1 underscore value 1 2 4 9, 9. So you can calculate that using the formula and you will arrive at the same value. Next, I will write the instance name. Next, I will pass the clock. So the input clock is of clock underscore 5m. That is the 5 megahertz clock. And the divided clock. Let's see what is the name. So, name of this divided clock. So, divided clock is of 200 hertz clock frequency. So, this is the case, right? Perfect. So, next, what we need to do, we have completed uh, the steps till here. I have generated a 200 hertz clock. Next, what I need to do is I need to generate this clock pulse generator circuitry, right? So let's do this. Right. So the input will be the 200 hertz clock and the button input, input zero, input one. And the output will be the clock pulse. Wait. All right. Okay. Okay. So let's define some variables. So first of all, I need to do a logical over operation on the input coming from input zero and input one. So let's define a wire, let's say input underscore power. Right. Next, what we need to do is uh, also I need to generate this circuitry. So this is again a sequential circuit. So I will have two different blocks. One is the combinational block, one is the sequential block. Right. So what I need to do is I need to implement this register. Right. So I will define, let's say, if from fun underscore reg flip-flop 2 underscore reg flip-flop 3 underscore reg and also for the next variables as well flip-flop 1 underscore next for the, they, this, these are for the combinational block obviously flip-flop 2 underscore next flip-flop 3 underscore next right so before writing all this block, what I can do is I can assign this wire input underscore R as a value of input underscore zero, logical R input underscore one. 
so that's fine. Uh, let's write the sequential always block. reg will be getting ff1 underscore next similarly ff2 underscore reg will be getting ff2 underscore next and finally ff3 underscore reg will be getting ff3 underscore next so this is all about the sequential block we have used this non-blocking assignment. So there is a reason to use this non-blocking assignment. So if you see this diagram, I need to connect one flip-flop to another and the output of another flip-flop, the second flip-flop to the final one. So that means all these, uh, this connection should take place. So if I would have been, you would have used the non, uh, that is the blocking assignment. So these three flip-flops will not be formed. What it what happened is only one flip flop will be formed. So I think that must have been covered in your lectures as well. You can refer to your lectures. All right. Next, let's write the combination of this block. Please have to write start. So my ff1 underscore next. This should be getting the input underscore or. So this is the thing happening. So my input will be coming through the R logical R operation. So this is my first flip flop. The second always block. FF1 underscore next. So FF1 underscore register output must be fed to the so this is ff2 underscore next and finally next step is to write a test pinch to check if my clock pulse generator is working fine or not right so let's add a simulation source clock underscore test pinch finish both submitted so the first thing is to define the registration wire go to red edge put underscore zero put underscore one and the virus plot also we can do one thing so that this you can understand this complete process easily we what we can do is we can define them as the output port so in that case you, it will be very easy to see how all the things are working, right? Though I will not need this in my main design, so just to check and show you how it, the whole circuit is working, I am doing this, right? So we need to define it as a register type because we are using it in the always block. So all the all the variables are uh, in the left hand side of the assignment should be of register type so we need to define it as a register type so you can define an output either as a wire or a register right inside the module and save it next thing is i need to define them as files so let's copy it from here and this right. next thing is to associate the dot Clock underscore calls one clock underscore 
0 input 1 is is connected to input 1 next is ff1 underscore let's do one thing let's put it here ff1 underscore h is connected to ff1 underscore h ff2 underscore h is connected to ff2 underscore h So we have instantiated the dot. The next thing is to initialize my registers. So for doing so, first I will initialize my clock as one P zero. Next I will initialize my input as one tp zero as well. Right. So this class is completed. Next we need to give the stimulus. Stimulus as well as we need to generate a clock. So in order to generate a clock of 200 hertz, I need a clock period of 5 milliseconds. So first thing what I need to do is instead of using nanosecond, I am changing it to milliseconds, right? So this is the first thing. So let's first create the clock. So after every 2.5 nanosecond, I might, I need my clock to get inverted. So that I get a clock period of 5 millisecond that is the clock of 200 hertz right so next thing is next thing is to give stimulus in such a way that I get a, a some bounces of the push buttons and finally the button should get settled on a high value so for that I will make use of two different kind of a statements right so now let, let me write it okay so i have written this stimulus so let me explain it to you how is it working so initially this are this is uh, all this is a statement we are very well know that after certain delay i am giving some uh, some changing the stimulus i am changing the input after some certain delay so what i am doing is before the arrival of the uh, like half clock period uh, i am like two, at 2.5, 2.4 nanosecond, I'm giving a one, and after 0.5 nanosecond, I'm getting it to zero, and then one, and zero, and so on. So the new thing which we didn't know till the last lab is these constructs. So we can uh, use the delay statements as well, but also we can use these edges of the clock to change my stimulus. So what, uh, if I am writing this statement, what I actually mean is that at every positive edge of the clock, I need my input to change to 1, right? At the next uh, positive, uh, positive edge of the clock, I need my input to again remain at 1. So at, at this point, at the negative edge of the clock, at the negative edge of the clock, I am getting my input to go to 0, right? So we will also look into the waveform and see how this is actually working. So now let's first run the simulation. Let's first save it. set this as the top module all right so now we can run the simulation oh 
okay so as we need to need a time scale of milliseconds so i have to run this for another one second right all right so now let's see how my test bench is working so as you can see for the input one first i gave with the with the help of the delay statements i gave certain uh, body bounces and so bounces using the delay statements right i started at 2.4 nanosecond and then after every 0.5 nanosecond i uh, give this highs and low highs and low and finally at the pause edge clock which i have used the construct pause edge clock as you can see here yeah. so as you can see here at the pause edge clock this in after this uh, after the debounces are done and my at the pause edge clock my input one should go at one thing b1 right so that's what it's actually happening and the next clock pulse uh, it is again remaining at one and similar for the next and finally at the negative of the clock i made it zero right so as you can see here at the negative of the clock i made it my input one is one tick b0 and at the next positive clock positive positive edge of the clock i made input zero as one tick b1 so if i see here at this negative edge my input one goes zero and at the next positive edge my input zero goes one right so now let's see how my circuitry is actually working so if i talk about this ff1 reg so at the first clock pulse my input was one right so my ff1 reg cause got gets a value of one right now when i was here at the next positive edge didn't occur so according to my code this always at the rate of star block should execute whenever there is a change in input underscore or so to my input underscore or is getting an input of input 0 underscore input 1 so at this point of time let's say where this my marker is so my input underscore or variable got a zero so that zero got transferred to my first flip flop and from the, and so so my ff1 reg goes zero so this one gets transmitted here then and at the positive edge a next positive edge my ff1 reg got zero because input underscore or got get zero at this particular point of time similarly this get transferred this ff2 reg get transferred to ff3 so at this particular instant of time is one ff2 reg is one but ff3 reg is zero that simply means when i logical and through all these three bits by taking the inverted form of this ff3 underscore edge reg i will get a clock pulse high clock pulse and at this point of time it will get you right because my ff1 underscore reg goes zero so that's how it is working for every press of the button so d bounces are happening and then it's getting one so after the sampling for three clock pulses, I'm getting an output of one, right? That's how I'm getting the output of one. That's, a, that's the logic, that's the pulse, that is the clock pulse, this, which will be going to the FSF module. At this positive edge, the sampling will be done in the FSF. Similarly, I'm getting the another pulse for this input underscore zero. So that's how my whole circuitry is working, right? All right. So now let's revert all the changes which we have done in clock underscore pulse module because I don't need this ff1 underscore reg until ff3 underscore reg variables. So let's close this and remove these things. All right. Comment it, save it. So it's recording. Next thing is to call my clock underscore, instantiate my clock underscore module here. It's clock underscore pulse, say i3. So it's clock underscore 200 edge, clock underscore 200 edge. Next is input underscore zero. And also let's make a wire of clock underscore pulse. The stick is input underscore zero. I'm giving it input underscore zero. Put underscore one and connecting it to input 
is to one. Find the clock underscore calls and connect it to clock underscore calls. Right. So so far so good. Uh, what we have done is we have completed our project till this part, right? All we need now is the FSM module, right? So now this is the actual purpose of this lab to learn how to implement an FSM using Verilog. So for FSM implementation, the very first thing I need is a state diagram. So first you need a state diagram which needs to be implemented in the code, right? So now let's look at how these things will work. So now let's create a new design source. Right. So if the sim underscore one one zero one one underscore maybe let's name this. Okay. So the very first thing I need is a clock pulse. The reset signal, both the inputs. So actually, I don't need input zero here. I only need input one. Right. So all I need to take care of whether input one is at zero or input one is at one. So if if if, if input one is at logic high, that means a one is being transferred. If it is at logic zero, that means your input zero is being pressed so that your, a zero is transferred. That I will interpret like that. Okay. So input one is more than sufficient for me. So that's all for the inputs. Now for the output, the very first output is the out. That's a single bit output. And one more thing is the present state. Because we need to display the present state as well. The present state. So the present state is a burst type. So we need to check what should be the width of my bus, right? Okay, to check the number of bits. I will look into the state diagram. So I have one, two, three, four, and five. Total five number of states. So I need at least three bits for that. So three bits I need for the representation. So from for the from three bits I can represent from zero to seven. So I need only five. Even then I need three bits. So that's it is as two up to zero. Right. So we forgot this present state. We need to make a bus. So this 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 change needs to be done in the top module as well. All right. Let's go to this module. Right. So there are some standard steps to make an FSM in Verilog, and you must follow these steps because this will make your life very easy. If you follow the same set of steps, I am gonna tell you in the next few minutes. So this your, your life will be very simple, right? So the very first thing is to define the register for the present state and the next state. So I know my state very uh, state. There are five num total five number of states. So these should be two round to zero. So I already have the present state. So that's not an issue. Let's define the register type because I I'm going to need it. I uh, use it in the always block, right? And also I need the next state logic. So for that I have defined this. This is the first thing that you have to define registers for the present state and the next state. You need to take care of the number of bits. You need to define the uh, states depending on the number of states in your state diagram. So the next thing is to define some parameters. So as so these parameters are very useful. These parameters are very useful. In two ways, at first it makes the code very readable, and secondly, you don't need to remember all those bits, uh, bit sequence, right? So if I am defining my S0 as let's say predict B00 as one as 001 as two as 010, that is two, as three as 011. And finally, S four, S four, right? So this is the parameter. So instead of using these uh, 
zero 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 one and everything. Uh, I can directly use the name. It is S zero S one and whatever it is. Okay. So, so the first step was to define the register for the present state and next state. Second is to define the parameters. Although it's an optional step, but I still uh, I will still recommend you to use the parameters instead of these numbers because it's not easy to recall each one of them. So the next thing is to make the first always block. So as we so what is the purpose of using this? Like if you you must have read about the inferred ledgers. So whenever you use if else statement, you case a statement, and if it is not a full case statement, there will be an inferred ledge. So to avoid that, either we can use the default statement, and we can very well assign the variable of the case statement. Like the uh, in our case, that is the present. Uh, so this next state assignment needs to be done. So if if we can very well assign it uh, before the start of the case statement, right? So I will start the case statement, and the the variable under consideration will be the present state, right? So let's start it. And this is an case. Now I will write the case statement. Let's first, I will do some indentations. All right. So first of all, let's when we are at the reset state, and if my input, that is input underscore one. Equal equals to one tick p zero. My next state will be s zero only, right? Else, next state will be s one. Or you can write it other way around as well. That if my input one is one, my next state would be s one. Or else, my next state will be s zero, right? So I'm just referring to this state diagram. So I'm at the zero. If my input is zero, I will stay at zero, or else I will go to S one, right? So this is for the S zero state. Next, I will write for the S one. So if the state is S one, and if the input is one, I will move on to the next state that is S two. So one one is already there. Or else I will move on to the S zero. That's again correct. Next is if I am at the S two and my input is one, right? If my input is one, I will stay at S two. I don't move anywhere, as uh, I can see. So if I am at S two and my input is one, I will stay at S two. And if I get a zero, I will move on to S three, right? This is my S three. If I am at S three and if my input is one, I will move on to S four. If my input is zero, I will move on, move on to S zero. This, as you can see here, if I am at S three, if my input is zero, I am going back to S zero, or else I am moving ahead to S four. So I have reached S four, right? So what needs to be done after S four? After that, I need to check for the input. If I am the present state is S four and if the input comes to be one, my output should go high. Or else, and the state should be this S two, or else I should go to Z, right? So how will I write that? So I will write one more state, one more block for S four. So if I write S four, and if the input comes to be one, that means my next state will be S two. If I look at this diagram, so my next state will be S two, right? And if I am at let's say S four and my input comes to comes out to be zero, I will go to S zero and output remains zero. And I uh, I am at S four and I I get an input of S one, my output goes to one. So first let's do this. The S four if I am at S four, let's say at S four, and if input is one tick B one, I will go to the S two. Else I will go to the next state is S C. That's fine. So that was your second always block. 
all this block for next state logic. Next state combination logic. And finally, I need to write an always block for the output assignment. So my output assignment should follow my state diagram. So whenever I'm at S4, and if I need to, I, I have an input of one tick B1, I should go to S2 that I have covered that I'm going to S2 in the, in the combinational logic itself, I have covered this, but I need to cover the output logic that whenever I'm at S4 and D in comes up to be one, at that particular positive edge of the clock, I need to assign my output as one, or else I need to assign the output as zero. Okay. So I need to write one sequential block for this. Is at the positive clock. So this should be clock and score pulse. If my present state equal equals to S4 and N. Uh, input underscore one is also equals to one tick b1 under this scenario my out should go high one tick b1 else my out should remain at one tick b0 okay Okay, so I have not defined my output as the register type, so that's why it's showing me an error because I'm using it, the, it in the, all this block. So this is my output assignment block. Okay, so now let's go through this code once again. So what we have done is the first, very first part is to define the present and the next state uh, registers. So the width of the register depends on the number of state. In our case, the number of states were five. So we need minimum three bits to represent the, uh, the states. So that's why I have taken two registers, present state and the next state. Second thing is to define the parameters. So these parameters define the states as in your state diagram. The next thing is to define one always block for your uh, present state assignment, and which is also the state register, right? So that's what we have done. So if clear equals to one tick B1, that means reset have taken place. This is a synchronous reset. So my present state should be as zero. That is your reset state or else my next next state should be assigned to the present state. Next is the combinational logic in which we have simply transformed my state diagram to the code. So you have to write this, uh, this, this way only. You, all the FSM you need to write in this way. And this is the very efficient way as you will see in the subsequent labs, right? So I have applied the case on the present state and whenever the input changes, my next state logic changes, right? So I have used this next state equals to present state just so that this remains as a combinational block and no inferred ledge occurs here. I can also use the default statement, but as I have used this, uh, I have assigned this next underscore state in the starting. So I don't need a default statement. You can also use a default statement instead of this. And finally, I need, I have used a sequential always block. So why I need a sequential always block here? So the answer lies in the state diagram itself. So if I look at the state diagram, let's see. So I am at S4. So uh, while I was, uh, I am at S4, the, when I see I am at S4 and I see that my input changes to one. So that sampling needs to be done at the next positive edge of the clock. That's what I'm doing. So at the positive edge of the clock, if I am at S4 and my input comes up to be one, I need to assign the output as one. That's why I'm using the sequential always block here, right? So this is all about the FSM block. So for the FSM, all you need is a state diagram and you need to follow these standard steps. So I can sum up these steps in like the total five number of steps. First, the register declaration. Second, the parameter definitions. Third is a three always block, one is for the present state assignment, second is the next state combination logic and the final one is the output assignment block. So this will not always be a sequential always block for the output assignment block. So the, in the Moore type FSM we will see that this is indeed a combination block. So we will look into that 
uh, as well. Next, let's now we need to check if my FSM is working fine or not. So for that, I will be making use of a test bench. Now let's see. Okay, let's create a test bench. First thing is to define the registration wire. So my register, there are three registers, clock and score calls. Okay. Uh, the next thing is let's see what clear input underscore one, right? And then I need a wire type. So there are two wire, one is for out, this is a one bit and one is for the present state that is a 3 bit for present on the score state so next is to instantiate the module so I can directly instantiate this FSM because I need to check the functionality of this 110111 Clear is the clear. Now oh, disconnected to out. Sorry, I'm not connected to one. All right. Next is out is connected to out. So one more thing I want to highlight here, the order in which you instantiate all these things. In the same order, you will get the waveforms in your wave right? Okay, so association is done. So the next part is to initialize my registers. to 1 pp0 I have initialized this to 1 p 0 clear I have initialized it to need to initialize it to 1 tick p1 because initially I will have to set my machine into a known state that is your s0 and finally input underscore 1 as 1 tick p0 that's done okay what's the issue okay. Then I need to give the stimulus. Perfect. So let's say after 10 nanosecond, my reset that my clear signal get down to zero. Right. Now what I need to do is I need to give the data with the data samples. So for that I'm not using the delay, the conventional delay is a statement which we use. So I'm using making use of the neck edge of the clock. Go to this P1 goes to one tick P1. Right. So I'm using it because I, I want to I am I am assigning this input one at neck edge of the clock because I want it to be stable at the passage of the clock at which the sampling is happening, right? So let's give it the same sequence which we have done here. So I'm giving I will give the same sequence one one zero one one zero one. Oh this one one 
zero one one zero one 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 zero one one zero one one zero one okay so I will also find you one zero one one okay perfect so if you see my first pattern completes here right so next patterns complete here and finally the next pattern completes here so this should be my result so my output should go high three times and also i need to give a clock so i am giving a clock of 10 nanoseconds so right now it does not matter because i just need to check the functionality of my fsm that's it all right so all the steps have been completed Completed. One zero one one completed and Okay, so now let's save it. We have saved it. It's great. Okay, next I need to make it as a top module. All right. Next we can run the simulation. Right now, let's look at how this is working. All right. So at this passage of the clock, I get a one. So my state cut from zero to one. So this one is encountered. At the next positive edge of the clock, at I got another one. So one one has been detected. So and I'm at second state. Then a zero is detected. So one one zero has been detected. So I am at the third stage then my fourth so one is detected so one one zero this one is also detected right now finally when i am at the fourth state and the another one comes my output should go high right that's what we have written in the code so at the positive of the clock i was at the state four and my output goes high sorry my input input comes out to be one so my output went high right that's what i already wanted so now now again sequences, I have already encountered one and one. So next I have encountered a zero. Next I have encountered a one. And finally again I have encountered a one. So my output went again high again, right? And similar is the case for this one. So as I can clearly see, this is an overlapping sequence detector. So I have given this input one one zero one one zero one one zero one one. So first my output goes high at here and then after two zeros my output goes high again and after two zeros my output goes high again. So that's what it actually happening. As you can see at this passage of the clock my output goes low, at this passage of the clock my output goes low. So two zeros in between and finally at the third edge my output goes high again. Similarly for two passage of the clock output goes low and the third passage of the clock the output goes high. So this is actually following the same sequence which we have understood here, right? So that means my sequence detector is working fine, right? So only one thing left is I need to instantiate my sequence detector module, my FSM module in the top module. Only that thing is left. Let's do this. Clock pulse is connected to clock pulse. Clear is connected to clear. Input underscore one is connected to input underscore one. Out is connected to out. And present underscore state is connected to present underscore state. That's all. Okay, so there's some issue. Let's see. Okay, so I have not put a dot here. Okay, now it is fine. Let's check it again. 
Okay, clock underscore pulse, clear input one, out and present state. That's fine. So I can save my top module. Yeah. So that's all for the part one of this lab. So in the next video, we will see. Okay, so some problem here. Okay, yeah. So this is 11011, not 110011. Okay. So we have seen, we have checked the functionality of our sequence detector using the test bench. So in the next part of this video, we will see how to check this on the hardware using the VIO. Right? Thank you.